begin by saying welcome to our third Tuesday series event. I'm Junko Yokota. I'm the director of the Center for Teaching Through Children's Books, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming a, three people who are going to give us some insights and understandings toward the work that was created by John and Pete together, and to welcome people who I have held in such high esteem over many, many, many years. From my very first edition of my textbook, written in 1994, to the seventh edition of my textbook, published last year, I have recommended their work because they're creators with such um, great stories to tell us and to show us. Today, I'd like to welcome Patrick Gall. Patrick is one of our friends at the center who really has been a backbone for us in many, many ways. Patrick's background is that he is a seed teacher seeking educational equity and diversity a teacher librarian for preschool and eighth grade at the Catherine Cook School in Chicago. He chaired the 2020 USBBY Outstanding International Book List Committee, and he continues to review for the Hornbook Magazine. But most importantly, Patrick is someone that we know if we get him in a room with many interesting authors and illustrators, he will ask very interesting questions that make us all think and develop a further understanding. So I welcome Patrick and he will introduce Pete and John. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Junko. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. It's not every day uh, that you get to interview, you get to facilitate a discussion between two internationally renowned um, creators. Um, John Agard, I'm so excited that you're here. Um, poet, teacher, um, you have an incredible catalog of books. I only have a few behind us, but it's so brilliant that you're here to um, provide your time, your insight. Um, and Pete Grobler, we're, your illustrations are so idiosyncratic and, and well-known. And just to have you both work together, um, you know, John in, in the UK and Pete in Portugal, um, it's just really incredible that we can, we can make this happen. Um, to, you actually, in, in part, one of the reasons that we're gathered here, or, or that we're able to get both of you here, um, is because of your collaboration through the book Coyote, Coyote Soundbite. Um, it is a Lantana book, um, and it came out this spring 2021, and we're lucky enough to have it here in the U.S. Um, so really, to begin, the work speaks for itself. Um, John, we were wondering if you would read an excerpt from, from the book that you wrote. Um, I can feel your enthusiasm all the way across the Atlantic. And I thank the Center for Teaching in Chicago. Um, interestingly, in London, there is um, what's called the CLPE, the Center of Learning for Primary Education. So I have a feeling that these centers are somewhat on the fringe. So, so thank you for inviting me. I, I like your enthusiasm, Patrick, and, and Junko, and of course, Christina, whose emails I might not have responded to. And then again, it gives me a chance to meet Piet. I call him Piet, but I, um, he's also known as Pete. I think my pronunciation is more authentic. Uh, never mind. Piet. I like the sound of that. So, um, Patrick, if it's okay, I'll give you a taste of this book, which is called Coyote's Sound Bite. And as you know, Coyote, um, who is a shapeshifter, a trickster, a creator, a powerful figure of American Native Indian folklore and pantheon. So I got the idea of having earth goddesses having a conference. The breaking news spread like bush fire among all the animals of the rainforest Earth goddesses were planning a conference. Excitement buzzed the air, as you can guess. The animals perked up 
airs, tails, feathers, spikes, horns, bristles, whatever. There they stood on four legs, on hind legs, on tiptoe flippers, you name it. The animals couldn't wait, couldn't wait. The coming conference of earth goddesses from far flung corners of the planet was going to be the first of its kind. And of course, the big burning issue the conference would discuss and ponder was whether humans are blind or have simply lost their mind. The art goddesses should have some clue. So they were all known to be very wise. On earth, they'd keep their watchful eyes down to a butterfly's silent flutter, down to the coming alive of a flower in the sun-blessed light of spring, down to a golden air of corn ripening a tiny seed waking in a cradle of darkness a snail on a leaf softly spiraling a mole in deep dung burrow unwinding the earth goddesses never miss a thing but even bushy-tailed smooth talking coyote who had traveled the world over and always saw himself as a globe trotter, was still to meet an earth goddess face to face. So you can imagine Coyote's disappointment when he heard that only female creatures would be allowed at the historic event. Not even the male earth gods, no disrespect, were welcome on this particular occasion. Since nothing ventured, nothing gained, Coyote decided on the spur of the moment he'd put on his wife's blue dress, a bit on the tight side, but would surely do. Besides, the dress went well with the toeless, high-heeled shoes and turquoise handbag. Out stepped Coyote with a zig and a zag, mistaking Coyote for a high-class lady. Two ravens ushered him to the front row. Then, the chair goddess announced herself. Dorana. She whose singing gave birth to rain had traveled from the land of the didgeridoo. To much applause, but without much ado, Dorana recalled how from her belly button had sprouted the very first witchetty grub for the first ever humans to feed on. The Rana and humans then spoke one tongue. So it was in the dream time beginning before the riches of the Rana's dark veins had become divided into losses and gains. With that, the Rana introduced Odudua, emerging from her calabash of ebony, Udawa said she'd keep it short and sweet. All she wished was to jolt human memory let them go ask the tree 
of 16 branches from whose flesh grew the first cola nut. When first humans toddled on their butt. <laughs> Imagine the first humans to toddling on their butt did make Coyote give a little grin. A laugh out loud would be embarrassing. <laughs> Next came the earth goddess Kujam Chantu, who spoke of wonders of which legends told. Legends passed on to the young from the old. How her eyes grew into the sun and moon. How her bones became hills. How her breasts became what's known today as Mount Everest. But most marvelous of her telling was how Kujum Chantu's own belly fat became home ground for humans to squat. I'll jump because I want to introduce the goddess from. Um, you know, that um, Alaska um, um, region. There is Pan, Pan, Panchachama, the art goddess from South America. And I'll introduce this goddess. From that part of the world, the Arctic. But she's very environmentally friendly. So after all these goddess speaks at this conference, along comes this goddess. Although the conference day had been sunny, the next speaker wore fur boots and fur coat with leather trimmings down to her knees. She was, of course, from the land of permafrost, where folk were used to the igloo for a home. She introduced herself as Earth Goddess Ninan. Forgive me, my friend. If I, Ninam, shed a tear, I grieve for the polar bear. My iceberg rider. For the walrus, my toot walking seahorse. When human doing destroys their feeding ground. When their home, sweet home, ice is no more. I ask, can my beloved creatures survive for a long? I think I'll stop there, Patrick. No, oh, thank you so much, John. That was that was extraordinary. Thank you. It's um, it's always wonderful to hear you read. It's always wonderful to hear an artist read their own or share their own work. But in particular, um, hearing you read your poetry is uh, it's an event. So thank you for that. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and I and I appreciate what you read um, for many reasons. Not only because it jump starts the book, jump starts your story but introduces some of the characters and the goddesses in particular. But also I think that it shows the humor that's in the book in addition to the serious nature, the more um, 
not necessarily grim, but but um, very meaningful. Um, uh, the, the meaningful aspects of, of the book, the, the serious, the serious stuff. Um, and, you know, considering that, um, you know, books take a while to make, um, art takes a while to produce and to get out. Um, this book came out earlier this year. I suspect it's been a project for some time. I mean, over the last year and a half, two years, there's been a global pandemic, um, political uncertainty, we're seeing that now. Um, and also not only political uncertainty, but env environmental uncertainty. And um, we're seeing that in, very clearly um, in 2021. Um, so having that said, this book, this book has been obviously a work in progress, but has its meaning, and this is for John and Pete, has the meaning of the book, um, has the significance of the book, uh, developed, changed, um, or even strengthened um, since since you completed it? Oh, well, um, I suppose that takes us to the source, how I got the idea, because um, I would hope that sometimes in my work, there was a hidden humor for adults, and then children get another dimension. So part of me was quite tickled, having attended many conferences with high-powered academics where they speak of the binary and the non-binary, and you hear words like paradigm and post-colonial and post-modernist. Thinking of that type of academic conference, I did find it, it appealed to my sense of humor, I suppose, to have goddesses, so they're introduced by a chairperson, you know, of a next speaker, but I'm not using that kind of um, expected academic format, but there is a hint of it where one speaker thanks the chairperson and so on and so on. And I felt um, goddesses would be an interesting way of gathering together a multicultural um, prism of goddesses. But in terms of the ending, which I wouldn't reveal because I don't want to give away the, shall we say, the plot. But when Coyote comes out with her sound bite, having put on his wife's dress, if I had ended the book there, because I'm, the point I'm making is when you're writing, it's your subconscious in a marriage with your conscious. So if I had ended the story with the Coyote, who is the male in disguise penetrating a, a female conference, I would have got some criticism, no doubt. It took a man, as usual, to give the ladies an idea, like a song bite. I didn't plan that ending. But as I went along, I suddenly got carried away on this wave. What if the wife? puts on male clothes and penetrates a meeting or conference of male goddesses. And I feel that that saves it. I wasn't planning that ending, but to stop at the bit where Coyote gives the song bite to the female gathering, it, it does fall into that trap where it took a man to give them a song bite. So I was happy when that twist came. Uh, Patrick knows the twist. I can see from his uh, twisty grin that um, he knows the twist. I wouldn't necessarily have to mention it. But um, I think you know where I'm coming from. That in writing, and I'm sure Pete will agree, um, he might have begun an illustration with a certain direction. But as you go along, you do this balancing act between what your logic and your um, consciousness of um, a political reality in changing times, but you are not subjecting yourself to the didactic. You're hoping that it will still excite as a story, but and at the same time challenge without laying your heart on, on, a, on a sleeve. Um, and this is what excites me because um, I suppose a lot of my reading and my influences whether it is Jewish Hasidic tales, whether it is Sufi tales, 
whether it's about the trickster, the Middle Eastern trickster, Mullah, Nasruddin, whether it's about your Burr Rabbit, an American folkloric figure as Coyote and, and poets, um, Zen Buddhism. Um, I've always been drawn and excited by challenging a mind without dictating to a mind. And um, it really excites me. And if I get an idea which could work, and, and I hope that Coyote worked, I'm excited um, because um, I think that's the nature of poetry, the ambivalence, uh, the mystery, the, the, the open-endedness. So adults could draw one aspect, which is satirical in a way, because a secret part of me is satirizing those conferences when the chairperson says, I'm, I know the next speaker, and they present a, a paper on, you know, poets, when we go to conferences, um, very often the poets disappear. Start hearing words like binary and um, paradigm and post-colonial. With, with due respect, you have what's might be considered a linear way of thinking. And if you're going to be a great academic, you do have to develop a linear trend of thought. I learned this when my daughter was writing her thesis for university. Universities expect a linear discursive mode of thinking. But poets, like tricksters and storytellers, have a more circular way, a non-linear way, of putting forward a storytelling. And um, I hope I'm making sense. Well, I think too, John, and it's interesting because when there's the satire in there, but those, those concepts in that circular way, um, in that circular way that you're approaching it through poetry, a lot of those concepts are still built in. It's just the approach is, is, is that, poetic, that poetic framework. But, um, no, so I do, I do appreciate that, but, but Pete, I'm wondering, has, how has, as the illustrator of this work, and also, because I can see a lot in the illustrations that you, as an illustrated work, right, this is a, this is a written poem that, um, and we can get into that, like, I'm wondering, you know, you know, was it, the intent is always to be illustrated, so Pete, you did your work, too, to add the illustrations, and I saw things in the illustrations that weren't necessarily in the text, kind of to what John's point is, you, you, he didn't have to dictate everything and you took it a step your, to, to your own place. And I'm wondering how the book sits with you now, what maybe a year later um, after probably creating it and within the framework of our time. Oh. Um, Patrick, you're very right. It, um... It's very interesting, John refers to the, um, the conferences and all those uh, theoretical terms. And since I was a lecturer, it was actually my job to, to think of things also uh, within, you know, uh, with regards to their theoretical importance. And then specifically when I got the text for this book, I read it, I read it again and I thought, how, am I going to illustrate this and make it accessible? Because it's a strange poem and I read it several times. Uh, I always work like that. I read the text several times and I walk for three days before I start to put anything down on paper. And um, because as John said, one doesn't want to be didactic and also with the illustrations, you, you have to get the attention of the child, entertain the child, of course, on that first level, but with this text, there is so much under the surface. There are so many layers. I could just point out, you know, um, John mentioned feminism, but in addition to that, uh, gender <laughs> identity, which is really handled in a very playful manner here, you know, him putting on his wife's clothes and vice versa, and also the, the fact that males have traditional roles versus females. One could look at the, um, you know, the host. John used the word post-colonial theory. Uh, that is quite important here as well, because we have reference here to goddesses from um, uh, 
First Nation cultures, uh, where those goddesses uh, originated, how would I portray them? Uh, you know, knowing that cultural appropriation is a, it's a difficult thing and it's a, it could be a dangerous thing, potential. There's so many, I don't want to say pitfalls, I want to say challenges with this book. And then, of course, the, the main theme, which is the e eco-awareness. Um, and all of these things went through my mind and I, and I got into a discussion with, um, with Alice um, Kerr from um, Lantana because um, she's all that a PhD in children's literature. So we talked about it a lot. Um, and also just the way of handling the, the animals because coyote is an animal, but coyote chooses to put on human attire to go to this conference. So the humans are making a mess of the earth, yet an animal has to disguise as a human to, to enter this conference, but it's also a conference attended by all animals. So you've got so many different levels because Coyote as a trickster, almost he, you know, the, the, bound, the normal boundaries are not there for him. He can transgress them, which he does, of course. The other animals are not, I haven't portrayed them with wearing clothes. They're, some of them are, as John writes there in the text, on all fours, some on their hind legs. So already in the text that John create this openness or this fluidity, which is quite humorous, which I think, yeah, I think it's a combination of John's sense of humor. And then of course, my choice of portraying this and trying to be uh, accessible, but also, well, let's say intelligent at the same time. I don't know whether I'm... I think Pete um, did some wonderful illustration uh, and I loved our collaboration. And um, I enjoyed working with Lantana, Alice Curry, and of course, um, um, Katrina from the Philippine Islands. They put great care into the book. And I think we managed to um, create a book which I think could appeal to adults as well, because very often picture book publishers tend to like a very minimal text and could be a bit scared of a longer text. So I'm happy that um, Alice Curry and her team from Lantana took the plunge of a longer text, because I think within adults, there is um, the child and you can get, um, important texts treated almost like a picture book. I mean, what comes to mind is Animal Farm. If you had Animal Farm done with illustrations, that could appeal to adults. But we have this compartmentalized way of thinking where people create picture books and then you move on to the next level and then you read novels. And interestingly, um, there are some young writers who presume that is easy to write a picture book, whereas it is the most difficult form to get accepted by a publisher. Writing a picture book is very difficult. It's easier for an artist. If the illustrator presents a competent text with marvelous illustrations, that could be accepted. If an unknown writer presents a very interesting text, but they have to look for an illustrator and they have to pay an illustrator. You're looking at financial practicalities and there's so many, and many people feel oh, it's easy. It's only a few words. But I think that um, the picture book format, even though we tend to feel you graduate from that or a better word is evolve. You evolve from picture books. That's for, you know, youngsters and then you, you move on to war and peace. Yeah. <laughs> it's I, 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 think, I think it's a great shame because I believe using the picture book format could appeal to the young reader and also adults could see another level and enjoy. I've seen a picture book of like um, a nonsense poem by Edward Lear, which appeals to adult humor, but it's presented as a single picture book. And, um, and, and I gave the example of um, um, jo George Orwell's Animal Farm. And then there's another beautiful picture book, um, The Little Prince, Antoine Saint-Exupéry. 
and a true yeah, uh, can key into that a, a true uh a, a, where something like little prints um necessitates the illustrations right it, it it's not the same book only as prose only as text right i mean i think like the books behind me which are, are your books uh collectively do exactly what you're saying that they're illustrated they're picture books yet they appeal to like an it's like an everybody book right from from our youngest to oldest and it's how you you know what is the uh how do you approach that like with your head and heart depending on your age so i was kind of actually I, i'm really this i'm really thrilled by this because i'm wondering with from you both like john what does it mean for you to write poetry that you know is going to be illustrated does that affect you as the creator and and pete like when you're illustrating poetry is that different than illustrating um you know maybe uh, an illustration an illustration job that you have or you know for a magazine or an or um or a like a, a long a long form picture book with paragraphs prose like so i'm wondering you know, John, when you're making these poetry books that you know are going to be illustrated, does that affect your creation process? And Pete, when you're making, when you're illustrating poetry books, does that feel different? Is there like, is there a different, a, um, a different approach? Oh, uh, that, that's an interesting question. Because um, if I'm doing a collection of poems, so they're miscellaneous poems, you know, um, or, the, or, or that was Goldilocks on, by, by a, a wonderful artist, um, Satoshi Kitamura. We've done many books together. No, if it's a collection of poems, I'm just writing the poems. I'm not thinking too much about the finished product. I'm writing them. It could take years. Some poems I go back to 10, 20 years later, you might, because you need distance and you see things clearly. So when the collection is put together, then the publisher will get around to an artist. But if I'm writing something which I feel has a picture book possibility, well, I, I am more conscious of the illustrator. I suppose you feel almost like a filmmaker. So you might, you start thinking, well, if I write, if I get a few nice lines, then that goddess comes in four boots. Oh, I can see the illustrator doing that. And then, oh yes, if she's riding on the walrus, uh, my iceberg rider, oh, that could be a possible illustration. So you begin to think somewhat like a filmmaker, slightly differently from if you're just writing poems. A poem might be six lines, 10 lines, you do the book, whether thematically, um, you know, synchronizing with each other, I wrote a book on mathematics, a collection on uh, science. I'm not thinking of the illustrations. It's a collection. But in a book like um, my response to Dante's Inferno, um, you might be thinking, well, that, that's the one behind you. So if you have this, um, um, for, for the, for the three-headed dog, you might think, oh, that'd make a nice illustration. And maybe the artist can... Um, do a modern dog like a rock viola and if i get three lines oh well, that will give him a, a chance to come up with something so you think like a filmmaker thinking in frames if, if it's a book with a possibility of a picture book but with a miscellaneous collection of poems whether in science maths nature you're just doing the poems and hope that you do them as best as you can and then the illustrator would respond but as pete hinted it's no point the illustrator illustrating what you are saying in the text. So the best illustrators, Satoshi Kitamura, who I've worked with for many years, and of course, Pete, our first collaboration, he has to bring a visual slant, like a counterpoint. So I'm playing verbal music, and Pete is playing visual music. I'm meeting somewhere. That's very, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, Pete, are you a filmmaker too? Is that how you look at how <laughs> two, filmmakers, two filmmakers in one, in, in one piece? Is that the, is that an appropriate analogy for you too? 
Yes, I, I think it is. Uh, John said it well. Um, and uh, to, to get back to your question, you asked whether the, the form that one is going to illustrate, whether it be a poem or a, a longer story or a novel or whatever, dictates your approach? I think definitely so, yes. One does approach uh, a poem much differently from a piece of editorial writing. For example, in this case, however, um, and it, 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 it links with what John said, that he, if, he, if, he, if this were just one of, say, 10 poems, I would have approached it much differently if it were in a, a, a collection of, of various poems. But in this case, it is so um, much a narrative poem. It could have been not a poem at all because there are so many characters. It develops as a story. It's, it just happens to be a, you know, a, a quote, poetic form. But um, so in this case, I approach it more like I would a, a, a standard or a more normal kind of picture book, with the exception that here there was a main, uh, the big challenge and I referred to already, and I think you, you touched upon it when you asked about the contemporary nature of this text. I think that was actually my main challenge, not, not so much the, the form in which the text came, but the several potential layers that it had and the meanings that are all hidden there or said, you know, hinted at, that, that got my attention and really made me think, okay, I have to be really um, thinking about what I'm going to do. I cannot just portray these uh, goddesses. You just make a pastiche of, say for the African one, anything vaguely African, collect it from the old, old continent and all slap it together. That is not respectful, I think, to, to the cultures of, of First Nations. And, and it's the same with, um, with, with in all of these cases. You cannot just do that. So I had to really think that over so much. And with the, with the gender, now the gender role play and reversal, that, that's more on a fun level because it's a husband and a wife, each, you know, stealing the other's clothes to go to a conference. That that's fun, but so I also approached Quixote different from the goddesses. I made them with with ink and a dip pen. That one. <clears throat> Whilst Quixote, I cut out and his wife with a cutter, but a rather crude one. Normally, I would use this one. I don't know whether you can see them. Put them against white. You know, the, the scalpel, that one, is normally used for very fine work, and the cutter <coughs> is a much rougher thing. This is actually a tool. But I used that, I think, in order to get a more crude um, cutout of the paper of the main characters, or to set them a little bit on different levels, because I they, got, they have different roles to play in the story. Just, just one example. But I've talked so much and so quick, so fast, I can't remember what you actually asked. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, gosh, I, we're actually, we're getting not too far off from, unfortunately, our clothes, but I do have so many different ways to go, but I have, uh, and different questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll do this. This might be something close to closing. Um, Pete, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, oh gosh, if there's any closing, I mean, the idea, sort of, I, I apologize, we're at like a closing time about five or six minutes, but P, I'm wondering if there's anything that you'd want to really just add or illustrations that you'd want to show to share a little bit about um, maybe some of your process or what you created or just as, a, as like a closing remark about working internationally as you do. Okay, uh, Patrick, um, internationally, uh, that, that aspect of it uh, gives me a lot of joy. I'm so fortunate to have worked with all these people from everywhere, um, but coming from South Africa, which is a multicultural country, there are so many uh, indigenous languages, 11 of them. Um, I have lived in the UK, now in Portugal, but for 50 years of my life in South Africa. So I would like to see myself a globetrotter. Globetrotter is not the word. I haven't traveled to all that many places. Um, 
I have seen many, but um, I love the idea and I love, uh, people have often asked me whether I would like to write my own, more of my own stories and illustrate them. And, and I would indeed, and I have written some, but I think having worked for so many people make me realize, I mean, I cannot really write poetry. I'm okay with something more humorous, but working for others gives me the opportunity of really working with the, some of the people like uh, as you mentioned, John Arnold Lawson and uh, John Agard. They're also so very different, but both in, 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 their, in their own right, wonderful. Um, I like to investigate the world with my work. And, and as you've said, this book definitely goes there. Um, and this book gave me, I had a lot to think about. Um, and I think I also try, I mean, it could sound a little bit um, superficial, but um, the way I went about this book was an actual fact to, to, to consciously trying to be more eco aware as well. I reused paper that I've already had in my vast collection of things that I can't simply not throw away. I collected pieces of paper like this, which is the cleaning of the roller. You know, when you clean, you have, I've done printmaking and I started to collect these scraps of paper when I was a lecturer at the University of Worcester, when we cleaned the, uh, the studios. Um, and later on, whenever I worked with um, acrylic, I would clean, I would take all the paint that was left and I would just clean yet again, use the, the roller and fill scrap bits of paper, keeping those. And with this book, I really had the opportunity to, to recycle and to reuse. And it was a bit symbolic for me, but big fun to really, I did not buy new paper. I just used what I had. Um, <clears throat> And it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is possible to be resource, resourceful and I think to go about carefully with, with our nature and our, our, our earth. For me, this was quite an emotional book. Yeah, beautiful, wonderful to do. No, thank you, Pete. I, I even think like in, in previous interviews, um, John has talked about how we're, you, we're reusing and collaging that creating poems is not entirely different than that. The, the actual physical working and moving of, of words as you do with paper uh, across a page. Um, I, and I wanna be respectful of, of folks' time. We're at um, uh, th three minutes to the hour. I just, want, I just wanna share really quickly that I'm, I'm grateful for the time together. I'm grateful for your work. And um, it's been a really interesting conversation. I'm wondering if Christina has anything to share or any question. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Christina Moorhead. I'm the program director for the Center for Teaching for Children's Books. I'm thrilled that we had this conversation with John and Pete. Um, you've given me personally so much to think about. Everybody in the comments was just um, sharing their, their insights and how they were resonating with everything you said about uh, it ecological issues and, and how you create your art, how you think when you, when you create your poetry. Um, so I just personally, on behalf of the center, for everybody here and everybody who's gonna see this video on YouTube when it goes up, I wanna thank you so much for joining us, Patrick. As always, thank you so much. And um, we, we look forward to possibly, if there's ever another book, to having you back and having a further conversation because I think we just scratched the surface. Well, well, thank you um, very much for inviting me, Christina. And thank you, Patrick, for conducting it in, in a nice, friendly way. And good to meet you, um, John Co. And Patrick and Christina, um, as I said, I've got a daughter who lives in Hayward, California, that um, I'm hoping to um, visit, um, you know, in, in some time in the future, not too late. But if I ever find myself in California, um, Patrick, do send me your email and you, Christina. And I feel if I'm in California, I would feel uh, it's my duty to visit the center in Chicago. Um, you know, we'd love to have you. We would love to the ex the invitation is absolutely extended. We'd love to have you. <laughs> and Pete, uh, wonderful to see you again. Thank and you, know, John. And hopefully we meet in England or Portugal. 
No, I've enjoyed myself and I, I wish your center the very best. Because like I said, um, these centers for teaching are very often um, just off the mainstream and are usually uh, vital resources for teachers seeking an alternative vision. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful afternoon. Take care, Pete. <laughs> thank you, John. Let yes. me know when you're in England. <laughs> yes. And I'll let you know when I'm in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Please do. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Christina, Patrick, and Junko, and John for the book. It was lovely. Thank you so much. And thanks again for your illustration. Thank you. Bye bye.